Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Developing a Memorandum of Understanding for Your School Justice Partnership webinar. I'm Teresa Bohannon, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I am a policy analyst with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. We are hosting this webinar today as part of our School Justice Partnership Project, which is a nationwide initiative to reduce school-based arrests and referrals to court. In October 2014, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention awarded NCJSCJ funding to support enhanced collaboration and coordination among schools, mental and behavioral health specialists, law enforcement, and juvenile justice officials to help students succeed in school and reduce exclusionary discipline incidences that lead to court and juvenile justice involvement. Today we'll be guiding you through the steps of developing an MOU for your jurisdiction. An MOU is a critical document in establishing coordinated efforts in a school justice partnership. An MOU is a multilateral agreement among multiple parties intended to express a common vision and line of action. MOUs represent a collective commitment among schools, courts, and other relevant agencies to adhere to specific principles and share responsibilities for the collaborative engagement. When developing a comprehensive MOU, stakeholders must specifically define the roles and responsibilities of each involved party, as well as clearly identify the areas of shared responsibilities. All MOUs should be developed with the understanding that it's a living document and will be subjected to regular revisions as changes in goals and dynamics will require adaptability to sustain an effective collaborative. I want to point everybody uh, up to the box that says Files 2. And this is where you can actually download the resources and tools that we'll be using today. And this will be necessary for you as we go um, through our webinar today that you can follow along and have these tools at, at your disposal. Today we'll provide the tools and resources necessary to create an MOU for your local jurisdiction. We're privileged to have with us today the Honorable Stephen Teske, someone who needs no introduction. Judge Teske is the Chief Judge of the Juvenile Court of Clayton County, Georgia. He was appointed a Juvenile Court Judge in 1999. Judge Teske authored the School Justice Partnership Model to reduce delinquency by promoting academic success using alternatives to suspension and school-based arrests. Judge Teske has testified before Congress on four occasions and several state legislatures on detention reform and zero tolerance policies in schools. The governor appointed him to the Children and Youth Coordinating Council, Governor's Office for Children and Families, DJJ Juv Judicial Advisory Council, JDAI Statewide Steering Committee, and the Georgia Commission on Family Violence. Judge Chesky was also appointed to the Georgia Criminal Justice Reform Commission and serves as the chair of the Oversight and Implementation Committee for Juvenile Justice. He has served on the Council of SAG of the Coalition of Juvenile Justice and the Federal Advisory Committee for Juvenile Justice, which advises the President and Congress on juvenile justice issues. He chairs the Southern Region of the Coalition of Juvenile Justice, and he is a member of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges and has served on our Board of Directors. He currently chairs the School Pathways Steering Committee and is a Vice Chair of the Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee. He is the past President of the Georgia Council of Juvenile Court Judges and the Clayton County Bar Association. He's written numerous articles on juvenile justice reform. He received his JD, his MA, and his BIS degrees from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. We are honored to have him here today. What is normally a two-day on-site visita visitation with Judge Tuskey, we are condensing down to a one-hour webinar. The resources we are using today are available here for download, and we encourage you to follow along with those tools, which we've created as a fillable PDF. We encourage you to connect with people from your community or state on this webinar today and after. This resource can be used with or without the use of a neutral facilitator. Let's go ahead and get started. These are some of the objectives that we have for our webinar today. Our goal is to increase the understanding of school justice partnerships, increase your understanding of the importance that an MOU plays in decreasing school-based arrest and referral to juvenile court, and increase the understanding of how to develop an MOU for your own jurisdiction. At this time, I'm going to hand the webinar over to Judge Teske. 
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Teresa, and uh, good morning or afternoon to everyone, depending on your location. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just share the format. Uh, I'm going to take you through the tools as we use them when my technical assistance team, which is a five-member team, visits other jurisdictions. Um, and so each tool uh, lays certain uh, lays a foundation and tools after that build on it like we're building a house to its completion. Uh, let me also uh, you know, point out that it's not necessary that our technical assistance team uh, is there, though you know, if anyone wishes to invite us, that's fine. Uh, toward the end, uh, we will share that I will make myself available, though, uh, that if you uh, proceed on your own in using these tools, which we do encourage, and that's the purpose, the main purpose of this webinar, is to get outside the technical assistance so that we can proliferate and generate more MOUs by the use of these tools on your own in, at your location. Now, the first thing that we do, so this is a two-day thing for us, okay, uh, and essentially what we do is we, we take people through these tools to build and create most of the terms for their agreement. After two days, we walk away, but we leave them with an action plan. And uh, so they fill out that action plan with the responsibilities, who will be responsible for these uh, items, and then the goals, and then they will finish it through toward signing their agreement. The first thing is what you see before you, the message matrix. Before you begin anything, once you create your stakeholders group, okay, everyone needs to identify why uh, they're doing this. So who's involved in it? What is it about? Um, you know, how you're going to do it? All around the why. And the reason for this is that you want to be able, and part of this is to create a common agenda uh, you want to give your stakeholder group a name, an identity. Uh, you'll be working together. You'll be getting close uh, with one another. Uh, and, but there's two big reasons for this. Number one uh, is, is externally, for external purposes. You want to be able to share with your community and even the media as they get wind of this or you announce it um, that when they ask a question of any stakeholder, especially any head of an agency, whether it be the superintendent, a school board member, the chief of police, the sheriff, the judge, whomever it may be, that they can pull this message matrix out and answer any of those questions, and everyone's going to be given the same answer. It will not be confusing. Number two, you want it internally. You want to use this message matrix to drive training within your agency, your respective agency. It's extremely important that what, what you agree on, what you sign, that everyone within your agency receives training on it so that everyone is on the same page. Uh, I'm going to be asking Teresa as the policy analyst and been involved in this for a long time uh, for any questions or comments that she may have before I go to the next slide. Teresa, do you have any regarding this slide? Uh, at this moment, we don't have any, Judge. Okay. All Thank right. You. So let's go, let's go ahead and delve into the tools. All right. So the first one's going to be the message matrix. Um, so here you have a box. It's a very simple instrument. It breaks down the why, uh, the who, the what, and the how. But notice in the middle, is your goal to reduce school-based referrals to core by developing a graduated response program. Now, you may alter that any way that you, you would like. But then at the top, you have your common agenda. Uh, that is, what is your shared vision? You want to you wanna capture it in some type of phrase, OK? And it's important, as I said earlier, to give uh, the, the group a name. Uh, so let me, let me give you some examples from around the country. And keep in mind, uh, we have been in 30 eight states so far um, and have helped many jurisdictions to 
uh, develop their school justice partnership using these tools. So I'm not going to be able and don't have the time to give the all examples, okay, that various jurisdictions have come up with. But let's just start with a common agenda, give some examples. The most common one is the keeping kids in school out of, out of court. Most of you have heard that. Uh, you have another which Virginia has used under the initiative of Governor McAuliffe, and that is classrooms, not courtrooms. Uh, others may include things like prevention, not detention. Uh, another one has been positive outcomes for kids. Um, then this common agenda is what comes after the name of the group. Uh, the most common one uh, is school justice partnership. Uh, another example one came up with uh, is YES, uh, all in caps, which stands for Youth Encouragement for Success. Um, and so then you move into watch. So what happens on the first day of the two day in the morning we just share all the research, all the studies, because it's important that everyone understands why we're doing this, okay? So for example, they will walk by, by noontime, when they begin to work together to develop their message matrix, they will be writing, they will have written in the box, because what's happening, they're writing all this stuff down as they're learning about it. Uh, increased graduation rates, for example, that's a reason why you'd want to do it. I mean, who would ever think that keeping kids in school would increase graduation rates? Um, you reduce juvenile crime. As goes graduation, so goes crime. Uh, improve school climate. Uh, reduce racial disparity. Avoid harm to students with disabilities. These are just some examples. Um, what are the, what's the research? What supports the why? Uh, that box right below it. Well, we know that arrest and detention increases as much as 50% uh, that the child will drop out of school or four times more likely if the student appears in court. That's the Sweeten study of 2006. Or improving school climate is related to positive relationships between adults and students, not so much the removal of students. Or, for example, 1% improvement in school climate increases attendance by 1.6%. So, for example, a 10% increase equals a, uh, in school climate equals a 16% increase in student attendance. Or how about what we all know, the adolescent brain research in support of this, or the studies around racial disparities in school discipline. And then the who, uh, something we're going to talk about later and we'll break it down. You know, schools need to be involved, law enforcement, prosecutors, defenders, courts, social services, mental health, private providers, the community. That includes parents, students, faith-based, how about businesses, how about your chamber of commerce, how about your advocates, including, uh, you know, the NAACP, for example, which is very important because of the racial disparities inherent in school discipline matters. But like I said, uh, how these folks all make their decisions, we're going to talk, there's going to be a tool I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Lastly, how will the partners accomplish this goal? We'll identify low-level offenses for diversion. We'll show you a tool regarding that, identify and create alternatives to referrals to court. We have a tool for that we'll run you through. Provide training for law enforcement and educators to avoid role conflict on campus. We have a decision tree tool we'll show you regarding that. And establish a clear delineation of these roles and create stakeholder groups and identify the champion or co-champions to convene the group. So this, these are just, and there's more we could write down, but I just don't have the time. But by the end of this exercise, the, the group will have their message that everyone can hang on to and give the same answer when they're asked questions independently. So, Teresa, any questions or comments you have about this one? Uh, not at this time. Thanks, Judge. Okay. So, this next one, all right, what you have here is a composite of the action plan. Now, at the end of this, I'm going to run you through quickly the, what is really a strategic plan, I just call an action plan. But each of these boxes, uh, like you see here, stakeholders, focus acts, identify responses, are broken down into single sheets with goals, who's responsible, the date, for your convenience, okay? But right now, I just want to give you this global look at it. And this is what we take folks through during the technical assistance. So if the goal is to reduce school arrests and referrals to the court, well, how do we go about doing it? Well, first of all, we need to identify the stakeholders, OK? You know, what's the approach that's going to be used? Who are the members? Who's the convener? Who's the facilitator? Who can provide support? 
From there, once that's identified, we then take the group through identifying the focus acts. Now, focus acts is defined as that delinquent act for which the agreement is focusing on not to refer to the juvenile court, okay? So we're going to identify the, those. And then we move on to identifying the responses. Well, if we're not going to refer them to the juvenile court, what do we do with these kids? And we're going to identify the type of responses that are unique for every jurisdiction. And then we're going to move on to, well, how are we going to apply this? Is it going to a graduated response? Uh, match the focus acts to identified responses using a graduated response matrix, and we'll show you that matrix and walk you through it. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I'll come back to these other ones because they go into a decision tree that I'm going to show you at the end of this as to what are the major components of an MOU. And uh, so I'm going to move on at this time unless, Teresa, you have any questions or comments. I don't have any questions. I just want to remind everyone um, to use the chat box for any questions that you do have, and we will use these. Um, at the end of each segment to ask those questions to Judge Teske and get some real-time uh, answers. So thank you, everyone. We really encourage you to be as interactive as possible. Great. Okay, so here's, here's the, uh, the first major uh, tool that we use. Uh, so it's the School Justice Governance Decision Tree. And this is just a simple device that walks everyone through how to develop a stakeholder group and who needs to be involved in it. Uh, the very first question is extremely important, sets the stage. Is there an existing collaborative? Uh, we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We do not encourage anyone to reinvent the wheel. Many jurisdictions that we uh, you know, visit already have some type of collaborative. In fact, some states have a law that requires that there be some local juvenile justice collaborative. Well, the, the question is, all right, if that's true, if the answer is yes, have all the stakeholders that are unique to develop any school justice partnership been identified? And this is when we started talk, talking about, well, who are the stakeholders? Who need to be in, who needs to be involved? Um, and, and, and it comes to who are the ones who have to operationalize this agreement? Who are the ones who are held accountable at the end of the day? Well, the decisions that are made on the campus, it's going to be an administrator and it's going to be law enforcement. We know those two are definite, okay? Now, beyond that, it depends upon the jurisdiction. We know we have some states in which it's the prosecutor who decides whether a kid gets diverted. In other jurisdictions, it's the court. Uh, but either way, we know that the next number of, uh, or type of stakeholders would be the courts, would be the DA, um, and then we can go from there. So you have those that are helping to operationalize the system, but then how about those that may have some, may want to put some skin in the game? The, and we need them to have skin in the game because they may have the resources. Uh, whether it be social services, mental health, uh, whomever. The community, because this is about the community. And do they have a voice in terms of providing some input into this? So once we list all of that, we ask ourselves with the existing collaborative, hey, uh, are all these folks represented for the purpose of developing a school justice partnership? Hey, if the answer is no, you need to go and identify those, okay? Now, the question right here is that, um, you know, if you already have an existing group, do you add them to the existing group or do you create a subcommittee? Um, and most folks just simply create a subcommittee uh, that is a school justice partnership or whatever it, name that you give it, and they work and report to the main body, the collaborative, which many of those members will already be working on or in this, this subcommittee. And then here's where it gets interesting. Um, that is, we need to identify voting members, okay? Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, but let me just share this with you. Uh, it's very important that we are careful that those who are operationalized the agreement, the ones who are going to be held accountable at the end of the day, like the police, uh, that is law enforcement, and the schools, 
um, are not in, placed in a position where they feel uncomfortable, where if there's that type of democracy that they're being told to do things a certain way that they don't feel comfortable with. Because if you do that, that's not practical. You're not going to keep them at the table. You may not even get them at the table when they walk into that room and they see all those folks. Okay? On the other side, we tell those who are the non-voting, the advocates, members of the you know, community, whatever the case may be, while you may not be able to vote on this, you know, quite frankly, you should be very excited that you're at the table providing the input to those who are voting on it. Okay, that's the unified stakeholder model. And in a moment, I'm going to talk about the bifurcated stakeholder model. We have jurisdictions who choose between the two options here. They give it a name, and they move on toward a school justice partnership. Teresa, do you have any questions or comments before I go to the next slide? I don't have any questions from the audience. Um, Judge Teske, there have been a few people that have, um, and, and I've heard it too, that the your line is kind of breaking up a few times when you um, are talking, so um, just something to keep in mind. So if we miss anything important, we'll let you know. So we apologize to everyone on, on the call right now. But um, no questions from gotcha. the audience. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, if there's something you've missed and you can make a point of where, uh, you know, on what slide and then later on at the end in the Q&A and so forth, because I'll be hanging on, I'll be glad to come back to that. Thank you. So I mentioned the two approaches, the unified stakeholder approach. This is the most common approach uh, that uh, jurisdictions use when we work with them. Um, and they like, and the reason why is that they, they, they find it more, uh, it's, it's more expeditious, it's more convenient. Um, and you'll see why in a moment when I contrast that to the bifurcated approach. But th the big reason is because everyone's meeting at the same time and everyone has the clear, uh, clear rules uh, on who's voting and who's not voting. Uh, and so w we have a set of rules here in this unified stakeholders approach. Number one, the school justice partner is responsible for school law enforcement and court decision making or mandatory voting members. So you can see by the arrows up there that once you list all the stakeholders, it, it helps you to, you know, guides you to where to put them on the voting side or the advisory side, okay? Now, rule two, two is that, you know, it, the voting members may include those providing financial or in-kind support. Um, those are the ones who have skin in the game, that the group is, wants them to have skin in the game, and because they have skin in the game, then they, they kind of earn that right to vote, okay? Because there's some accountability there uh, because of, what they're providing. Rule three is all others are advisory members. So it makes it very simple. Everyone else then goes over there. Um, and then rule four, school justice voting members may veto decisions contrary to regulations or the law. In other words, you may have something where you're an educator and there's a certain law, educational law and something's being suggested but it would violate that law. Well, no, I've got to veto that because the law says we can't do it that way just as a simple example, okay? Now, one of the things that is very important here is that when you bring stakeholders together, one of the big questions I get, but it's already been settled. By the time my group comes out to any jurisdiction, somebody has already identified a champion or co-champions, all right? It tends to be juvenile court judges. However, we are finding this growing trend of law enforcement next in line, we're getting more and more chiefs of police and sheriffs uh, who are inviting us to come out and become the champion, the convener, along with sometimes the judge. And we're beginning to see some school superintendents doing the same thing. So this is really catching on. So you wanna first, before you move into any of this, identify a champion who can convene people. That is, they have the vision, they, they, they know the stakeholders, okay? And therefore, they have that type of authority where when they make an invite, people are going to show up. All right. Teresa, any questions you have before I go to the bifurcated slide? Oh, uh, so I do have a question from the audience. Um, it's from Stan, and he says, I work with federal tribes. So is there a difference in the MOU when the partners are uh, tribal nations and public schools? 
And, and thank you, Sam, for your question. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And, you know, it, it, not, not really. Um, you know, it, 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 because when I, get, when I get to the school justice agreement decision tree, okay, you're going to see how flexible it is and how adaptable it is uh, given, you know, whatever uniqueness there is. So whether it's tribal uh, versus a, 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 a public school, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it really allows you to be flexible and adapt regardless of the government structure, the decision-making structure, um, you know, of, of, the, of the organization. Um, you know, I have done some work. Uh, and, in fact, um, Teresa, uh, one of our participating sites on the school pathways uh, is a tribal court. Isn't that correct out of California? That's correct. Yes, and, I, and, and if I'm correct, I think in, 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 in your analysis, you know, the analysis that y'all did in the recent thing, even though I don't think it pointed out, but I recall some maybe other um, comments on the side that, uh, that that particular tribal court actually made some pretty good headway, if I'm correct, if I read that right. I, I believe so. Yes, yes. So, um, so, but I, I'm glad to entertain any more in any specific question uh, regarding the differentiation that there is between the public and, uh, and, and, and tribal communities regarding this, especially, so Stan, when we get to this school justice agreement decision tree, pay particular attention and be ready to ask me any questions. Okay, and thanks for that question. All right, so on the bifurcated stakeholder group approach, we don't have as many folks that choose this one, but we give it as an option. The reason is that it takes a little bit longer. Some folks like it because rather than having the advisory members meet with the uh, voting members, uh, those jurisdictions have decided, well, we just want to have a smaller group. Maybe we might be able to make decisions a little bit quicker and not have all the uh, you know, all that extra time and so forth and so on, and just come up with a, a proposed school justice agreement and then convene either a combined community subject matter form or divide it up where you have a subject matter form. That would be those who could possibly put skin in the game. Um, your social services, mental health, they tend to be your, your, your more public agencies, um, and, and then a separate form, which is your community form, which would be your parents, your youth, your faith base, your advocates, uh, business, and, and, and others. Um, so, and if anyone wants to know how that may be worked, and I do know that it was Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, uh, that chose to do the bifurcated stakeholder group approach. And, and Judge Elizabeth Trosh there uh, is, would be the person you would want to make contact with. Uh, Teresa, any comment or questions on this slide? I'm looking through. I don't have any uh, comments. I have a lot of people that, um, for whatever reason, are not able to download the file right now. And so if you do want to send me your email, I can send that out as we go along. So those people um, send it to me now in the chat box. Um, I do have a question, a personal question. Oh, we just got a question. Um, how do you balance local community stakeholders and efforts with regional, for example, countywide stakeholders and initiatives? And thank you for the question. Yes. Um, well, I guess first of all, I would need to ask. Um, I would need to ask the question in in terms of balancing. Um, you know, keep in mind that when we go in, we generally are working with a particular school district, okay? Um, now, we deal with folks who have multiple school districts in their jurisdiction. Now, when we're working with just a single school district, that makes it easier because that school district may be, is going to be uh, either the entire county or it's going to be within that county. So, you know, you may have, so you're going to have either countywide or more regional folks that, per, that 
that school district is within their domain or their jurisdiction, um, and so we want to invite them there. When you use the unified stakeholder approach especially, there really is no line of demarcation. We're looking for anybody who has any involvement in that particular geographic area that that school district is servicing. Even though that uh, entity may work beyond the geographic district uh, you know, for that, for that school system. Um, and, and what else helps? We don't have to worry too much about balancing, especially if we already have a clear, uh, you know, if, if we know who's going to be voting, okay? Um, because everyone else that's involved is going to be providing input. Now, what we recommend is that in going through the, stakeholder, the, the, the stakeholder group meetings, is that it's best that the convener, whoever it may be, not be the facilitator. Um, Doug, you're breaking up again. All right. Teresa, can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do have one other question. So when you're done um, with that, we'll get to the next question. Yeah. So, so, uh, I just want, I want to finish with that by simply saying that you, you want that neutral facilitator to come in um, and then we'll guide and everyone will have an opportunity to say what they need to say. Uh, whereas the convener, you know, if they're convening the meeting, it's best that, you know, they're not facilitating it because the convener is going to be somebody that has some type of skin in the game, uh, whether it be law enforcement uh, and and they they are not going to be they're going to be biased to some degree. Let's just face it. Okay, I had to learn this back in 2003 uh, when we formed we created the first school justice partnership in the country. That it was best, even though I convened everybody, uh, I was and I just I give it to luck that not not due to smartness that I said I'm going to bring in the head of our state advisory group to facilitate our meetings, okay? And it worked out really well. What's the next question, Teresa? The next question comes from Carl, and he's asking what the costs are associated with working with a particular county school system. Well, you know, initially, um, there's no cost uh, when we started this, okay? Uh, now, there are costs that over a period of time, because now keep in mind, now we we started we created this in 2003 started it in 2004 so being the first school justice partnership the significance of that is not in being the first but the fact that we have all this data over a long period of time but the other thing is is that we've been able to grow and the more success that we had um, we were able to attract uh, funders um, not only that but even the agencies. Uh, the school system, my board of commissioners have uh, placed money in our budget. We've been able to attract grant money um, that has been able to grow um, these responses, these alternatives to arrest, okay? But in the beginning, it was very simple. It took us, and I'm, I was going to share this in a moment, and I'll repeat it in a moment, but it took us seven months. It took us nine months to sign an agreement, but seven months just to figure out what the focus acts were. And bear in mind, we did not have a focus act tool. So, and this is how we developed the focus act tool: is by asking my. I asked myself, if I could go back in time, what would I like to have that would have taken that seven months and shortened it down to maybe a day? Okay, and that's how we came up with this tool. Um, you know, so. Uh, when we came up with it, it was only four offenses, all right? Very, I mean, disrupting public school, disorderly conduct, um, school fights, and obstruction of an officer, the misdemeanor kind, uh, not following the lawful command. Now, today, our memorandum includes all misdemeanors, okay? But understand, we've grown it, and we can accommodate all those misdemeanors now with responses. But in the beginning, we couldn't, and so there were only four. And it was very simple. We just had a school, we developed a school conflict workshop, and part of the agreement is that the court would provide that on neutral grounds 
which is in the school system, not at the court, okay? Because we didn't want kids thinking that they were, we didn't want to label the kids by bringing them over to the juvenile court, so we went over to the school system. And we did this for, you know, a number of years uh, until, you know, we started attracting this funding. Uh, so at first it was no cost, but monies eventually came. And that's the other thing, too, in having, um, I want to go back to why it's important to having these advisory members there, because they, look, I'm going to tell you something. We were in Idaho back in June. We did about five sites. I had the chief of probation over in uh, Twin Falls who get up and just made this statement that I will never forget. And he said, you know, I've been sitting at, I, I'm sitting at this table. I've been doing this for this long. And there are people here I've never met before. And I'm learning what they have that I never knew they had that. They helped me out, okay? And that simple communication is so significant. So I hope that answered the question. Uh, anything else, Teresa, before I go on to the next one? Yeah, and this is going to be our last question. I just want to remind everyone that we will take another 15 minutes after, and we'll open up the lines and uh, allow people to ask um, questions directly, but this will be the last question before we need to move on. So um, somebody is interested in why parents and youth are not considered or listed as a primary school justice stakeholder um, in the bifurcated or a voting member in the unified uh, slides. Yes, okay. Um, they, uh, well, first of all, in the bifurcated, uh, really what it, uh, well, the parents are in the youth in the community form, okay? Uh, and they are as an advisory. It's very simple, uh, you know, when you, when, when you share it this way. Do you want the police and the school system to be at the table to even have, a, even to have the conversation to reduce school arrest? Because let me tell you something right now, that's half the battle. Half the battle is getting them to the table. I realized early on, okay, that if, if look, I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. If, if I walk into a room and there's a decision to be made about how to operate my court, okay, and most of the people in the room don't even work for me, don't work in my court, aren't going to help. If something goes down and goes bad, it's going to be my name out there. Why should I allow people to vote to decide how I do my business? Now, that may rust some feathers for some people, and that might be offensive. But, you know, folks, I'm talking about success. Because if you stand your ground that they have to be voting members, you'll never get to the table, and you've already lost the war. You haven't even gotten to the first battle. And, and, and so it's a matter of practicality. And so, and I have this, conver we have this conversation on the first day. When we go through the whole stakeholder thing, I, the parents that are there, any youth that are there, the faith base, all these folks, we have this conversation. I have yet to have any of them raise an eyebrow and have an objection to it. They get it. They're happy that they're even there. They're excited that this is even being called because they've been wanting it for years. And now they're sitting across the table from the superintendent and from the chief of police and from the sheriff having a conversation about reducing referrals and why they need to be reduced. And you wouldn't be there if you, if you created these type of obstacles that scares the heck out of these folks. That's just the way it is. Okay, so the next step is the Focus Act decision tree. Now, i got to share this first. Remember I said it took us seven months? Now, in using this decision tree, this algorithm, that it has not taken any jurisdiction more than an hour and a half to decide what delinquent acts they are not going to refer to the juvenile court. That's right. No longer than an hour and a half, where it took us seven months. Now, how does it work? You want to go ahead and get all the offenses that occurred, the delinquent acts that occurred on school campus the previous year, okay? 
if you want to, you can go to the year before just to make sure you did everything, okay? Well, the way this is set up is that you want to first ask yourself, will the offense, so what we do is we go down offense by offense by offense. We have this flip chart paper, okay? And we write the offense, and next to it we'll put yes or no. Yes, it's a focus act. No, it's not, okay? Well, to do that, we, as we go down each one, we ask this question, will the offense be diverted from a formal petition? Now, why is this important? You see, ladies and gentlemen, we realize that we had a system in which was not transparent. You see, the SROs would say to a kid, hey, you're going to go see Judge Teske. I'm arresting you. You're going to juvenile court. Now, you know, folks, by the year 2000, and four, we had nearly uh, 1,400 referrals from the school system, okay? And 92% of those were misdemeanor offenses. And pretty much that 92% was diverted. So think about it. Police were telling kids they're going to go see Judge Teske in a threatening manner, and they never got to see Judge Teske. And that became a joke. Well, I don't want that to happen. I don't want my law enforcement looking like a joke. We need to bring transparency to this. So why refer a case to the juvenile court if you know it's not going any further, okay? And by the way, here's the other reason why. Why refer the case when we know this in the Sweeten study that kids who are arrested on campus are twice as likely not to graduate? So why even go there if you know they're not going to appear in court anyway? Maybe we need to simply pick up diversion and move it over to the campus or somewhere else other than in the court where we're not putting handcuffs on a kid, all right? So if the answer is yes, it goes into the box. If the answer is no, we don't stop there. Now, the first question is whoever does your diversion decision making, they're key role players here. When you go to the next box, it's the judges. The judges get involved here. Once in court, is it more probable than not the judge will divert or informally adjust the case? Now, sometimes this box and the next box where it says yes are the mitigating circumstances can sometimes blend because judges will say, you know, most of these, when it gets this far and, and it, they're here merely for due process reasons, the kid entered a denial, the kid was tried, okay? But I would, I would, uh, not put the kid on probation. I would divert it. Now, what happens is that are there mitigating circumstances? That's where judges are saying. Some, you know, judges will say, I will do it if it doesn't involve a physical injury. If it involves a physical injury, the answer is no. Okay? All right? So that gets down into the details from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. All right? But so you want to go through that process, and depending upon the type of offense, any mitigating circumstances, because you can have some offenses that it depends on the circumstances, it will be diverted or not, will determine whether it goes into the focus act or it goes to the juvenile court. But I want to say one thing before I, I move on. There is a very important rule here that I don't have on the slide you need to make a note of. When you're working this decision tree, don't decide what should be a focus act based upon what alternative you currently have available in your community. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just go ahead and answer the questions and decide whether it should be a focus act, regardless if you have any alternatives. Here's the reason why. You're going to go through all, we haven't gotten to the point of identifying alternatives anyway, but you're also going to be deciding what alternatives you would like to have that you don't have so that you can work on getting those alternatives, which means you might create a memorandum of understanding for which may not include all these focus acts because you don't have those alternatives readily available. Take Clayton County. Remember what I said? We had four, only four because we did not have the resources to take on any more, okay? But look where we are today. We now include all misdemeanors, and by the way, it is in discretion of the SROs on felonies. They can elect, and we give them the discretion not to refer a felony, like a terroristic threat, okay? So uh, just keep that in mind 
uh, because you can always amend your memorandum of understanding to include additional focus acts at a later date as you develop those alternatives. Okay? Uh, Teresa, any questions we have? Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, the first one is just kind of a quick answer. So you have referred to multiple studies throughout this presentation, Judge Tusky, and a lot of people are interested in getting their hands on that study. So if you can share those with us, um, or point people in the direction of where they can access those, that would be really helpful um, because people probably want that information. And then the other question um, that has come up a few times, and, and we've actually had examples of this from sites that we've worked with, is what do you do in jurisdictions where you have multiple school districts? Um, I think Fulton County is a good example. They have a couple different school districts. Um, we work with one site in Ohio that has 29 school districts, and I think it's a very valid point. How do you handle those situations? Yes, that, that is a great uh, – let me – on the first uh, on the first thing about the research and the studies and all that, uh, it's a matter of logistics. I have a PowerPoint slide that I use on that first day in the morning that includes – like, for example, when I made mention about school climate and, you know, if you increase it by, you know, ten, you know, by whatever percentage, you'll have this much increase in attendance. I have that on a slide with all the credits, the source. Teresa, is that something I can send to you and you can get out? Absolutely. And, and just to remind everyone, we're recording this. We'll make it available. Anybody who's registered, um, this will all come to you. So um, don't panic if you don't have it right now. We're definitely going to make that all available. And so all these studies that he's referring to, um, we'll make sure to include that in our email. And then we also want to point everybody to our National Resource Center, um, which Elo has made um, a couple links available, but that's um, schooljusticepartnership.org. We have a pretty comprehensive library in there as well, so you can just search for some of these different things. That's wonderful. Now, as to the multiple school districts, so yes, we've encountered that. And in fact, the very first school district, the very first jurisdiction that uh, invited us to do TA was Jefferson County, Birmingham, Alabama. So they have the Jefferson County School District, they have the Birmingham School District. And there were differences, you know, in, in a number of ways, but the more difficult one for them where there was a greater amount of racial disparity uh, was was in the Birmingham School District, uh, and we're going a lot of years back, okay? And uh, so, so th you know, our recommendation is is that you know you can bring multiple jur um, school districts in, uh, but you you need to make sure that first of all you can you have the capacity to handle, okay, uh, the number of people in a room. All right, so it's very simple as that. Uh, but, but I would suggest, which is what's happening, like let's say Houston, okay, back in 2013, um, you know, Houston has a number, Harris County has a number of independent school districts. They convened about, I mean, it was about 750 people, okay, from all over, from all the school districts. I did this presentation on all of this. Um, but the decision was already made to move on only one independent school district and to work with that school district and to develop it and let it become a model site and then use that model site, okay, within the county for the other school districts to replicate, all right? And so I, was, I went back to Houston uh, this fall, and sure enough, uh, that's what they're working on right now is how, can, let, how do we proceed? They said, Judge Teske, how do we proceed? Now, in replicating, now that we have the school district that has this remarkable data, okay, um, and others are now wanting to do it. And you end up, because sometimes you'll have school districts that just don't want to do it, all right? But then later on, when these outcomes become, are shown, wow, okay, now they're knocking on your door, okay? All right, so uh, that's the worksheet you see in front of you. That's for your convenience to use. You can copy that and, and just fill in fill in the spaces, okay? Um, now, Can you yeah. just provide a couple focus acts um, that, you, that um, you found successful? Just a few maybe for people. And if other people too on the call um, have done this work, if you want to share in the chat box some of the focus acts that you've identified, that would be great for other participants to see. Yeah, I, I think the best way to answer that question is 
it's really around the responses that we've been able to develop. So for me, for example, uh, you know, as I've already said, we've already, um, you know, we're at a point now we include all the misdemeanors. But let's let's take even let's take the one that kind of people cringe about, you know, possession of marijuana. Okay, I mean, we already have signs that this is a drug-free school zone. All right, so that really now challenges us. Um, but, you know, hey, these are kids. They're neurologically wired to do stupid things, despite how intelligent and creative they are, okay? Um, and so we need to factor that in. So what we've done, and I'm going to show this later uh, in just a, a minute, a few minutes, and that is we have now created a system for which we have a drug education program, okay? And I, I want to do a shout-out to Broward County down in Fort La Lauderdale, and there's others I can share as well, but... I know they focus on that as well, and I, I really commend them because they did that from the get-go where that scared the heck out of us back in 2003. But anyway, uh, drug awareness program, sometimes we have kids, we feel that may, you know, so we, we have a system now that made available to have them assessed, okay? And we also have a system in which our probation officers volunteer in a discreet way that to help ensure that they are remaining drug-free, that we test them uh, privately and confidentially, okay, on campus with the consent of their parents. Um, you know, so that's one extreme. But then I'm going to show some other examples in just a moment, um, you know, around things like inappropriate touching um, and, and criminal damage to property or damaging school property. And, I, and so I'm, I'm going to show some alternatives that have made it more comfortable for the school resource officers to say, no, I'm not going to refer this to the juvenile court because I have this option now. What school resource officers tell me, my school resource officers, they feel they're actually contributing. They feel they're actually doing good because they now have something they can talk to the parent about, that they have a resource and they're part of sharing that resource and that empowers the school resource officers. After all, they are called school resource officers. It's up to us to give them the resources. So anything else? Uh, I, 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 is there anything, any, any other question, Teresa? I don't think so, and um, we're getting a little short on time. So um, I think gotcha. we'll probably stop questions for now and just um, hold them to the sure. end. Sure, sure, okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, th let me just quickly go through this. It's very important before we go on into developing a a uh, alternative response and a graduated system that we understand what should be the roles of educators and the role of the law enforcement on campus. This is extremely important. You take Columbia, South Carolina, unfortunately deputy field. If they had this type of decision tree or algorithm in place set in their policy, deputy fields would still be working today, okay? He never should have been in that classroom. Um, it's very simple. Um, what we do know, uh, the teacher sees the student with the phone, tells the student to put the phone up, but the teacher says, I want the phone. Student says no. Teacher brings the principal in. Same thing occurs. Then the principal at this point says, I'm bringing in the school resource officer. Now, up to that point in time, there's no criminal offense, none whatsoever. And now you bring a uniform officer in, and, and in South Carolina, like Georgia, you, you give a direct command and you disobey it, it becomes a misdemeanor offense, she resists arrest, becomes a felony offense, and boom, it's way out of control. When all the teacher needed to do in the first place was simply say, once the student put the phone up, thank you, Susie, for putting the phone up, and do it with a smile, by the way. We're going to go on with class. We'll talk about it later, Susie. That's it. But if you just go through this, you know, the very, is it even delinquent? But even if it's delinquent, does a school resource officer need to be involved? If the answer is no, no law enforcement officer, go to your school code responses, okay? If it's something, now sometimes school resource officers there, they see it happen, a school fight. They go to break it up. Is it necessary to have to treat it as a delinquent offense? And the answer is no, okay? But let's say it is treated as a delinquent offense. And the next question is, is it a focus act? If the answer is yes, then you go with your response system that you've decided on. If the answer is no, you still ask the question, can it be resolved using a problem-oriented 
approach, even if it's not a focus act, okay? If the answer is yes, look at the responses. Maybe that, that might handle it, okay? Otherwise, it's referred to the juvenile court. All right. Now, here we get in as we move toward the end of this, the alternative. So what we do is we have everyone take the focus acts. They, this is this matrix. They list them out at the very top. Then they break the focus acts down into classes of the offenses, you know, per, crimes against persons, property, weapons, inappropriate touching, drugs, public order, or any other one that's unique to their jurisdiction. I break them out into groups, okay, and we make sure each group is diverse, okay, law enforcement, social services, da da, so forth and so on. But anyway, their job is to brainstorm what are appropriate responses? What would be some responses that you have in the community? And what are some responses you would like to have but you don't have right now? And mark those as I don't have now. And they list those at the bottom, okay? So for real quickly, uh, just to give you, and I don't have much time, but like we have the school conflict workshop. I mean, there's simple things like warning le warnings, uh, apology letters, uh, but beyond that, uh, people have developed uh, restorative boards. Uh, they've come up with, you know, there's peace circles, like let's say with, with the person, mediation, um, property. There's a theft workshop. There's a restitution program. Uh, there's peer court um, in, in weapons, like, you know, bringing a knife to school, but it wasn't used in an offensive manner. Uh, a safety type of workshop, understanding the dangers of of, of such things, uh, inappropriate touching, uh, a boundary stain or something around, you know, inappropriate touching. Um, and then uh, I've already talked about the drugs, the, you know, drug awareness, testing, counseling. Um, so th that's just to name a few. There's a lot more. It's been very creative across the country, okay? Uh, so there are no limits, no boundaries on this. Um, so any, anything, Teresa, you want to add to this? Um, I, you know, I don't. I, I did ask everybody if you have examples um, of how you filled out a um, response matrix. Please share in the chat box. I'm so excited to see um, all the examples that have been given so far. Um, I also want to point people to some of our previous webinar series where we have um, a whole series on the responder model, which can also fit very nice into this piece on the MOU because you definitely need that piece of if you take away school arrests and um, you you kind of put it back on the schools, there, there definitely needs to be something filled in. And so um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through that today, but we do have resources available. And again, I encourage people to share and um, hold your questions to the end, and we're going to try to get to as many as possible. So back to you, Judge. OK. And we, we share with people, look, please don't just give one bite at the apple. Kids are kids. Remember what I said earlier about the frontal lobe, okay? They have trouble translating emotion into logic. Um, they're bright. They're creative. I don't want to take that away from them. But, you know, hey, you know, we ask ourselves and think back about things we did as kids. Give them more than one body of the apple and develop a graduated response decision tree. And this is a, I mean, a, a graduate response system, but use this decision tree to help guide you in developing it because it may depend upon the type of act. Like if the first act, you know, does the type of act require restitution, drug assessment, treatment, or other response, possession of drugs or whatever? I mean, is it, is it good enough just to give a warning with possession of marijuana? Most people are going to say no, uh, right? Okay. You know, so if the answer is yes, then it may move to that level of the second act, which you want to match response to the act using the response, you know, uh, matrix. Now, that doesn't mean that if there is a second act, okay, but that second act doesn't involve possession of marijuana, maybe it's a school fight, all right? Does it mean that all of a sudden you go to court referral just because you skipped the first act? You have to take a look at the nature of the offense because they may be different. You know, we get concerned in our business when we begin to see a pattern of the same type of offense, all right? That's a little bit more aggravating, okay? But kids are kids, and they may mix, and, and you know, they'll mix it up uh, with their decision-making, okay? We always emphasize where you can start off with a written warning, okay? And I can always provide examples of that. We, we've, we have one we've been using for years, all right? Um, so... 
Uh, any questions there, Teresa? Uh, no, and I think we should move on. We have only about five minutes left. Okay. So going back to Stan uh, regarding the tribal court question, okay, uh, I know you have to kind of look in at this one, but this is your decision tree. Let me just say this. I can't go through everything, but notice how I just want to give you some direction. When you get to the point of developing your MOU, after you've developed, you've got your terms, you know, you know your, your focus acts, you know this and that and so forth, okay, Notice how I've broken down. There's the components of the decision tree. I mean, of the uh, school just There's your preamble, your definition section, your terms of agreement, and your quality control section. Then I give you the purpose. You know, why do you have this preamble? Because it, it tells the public, it tells everyone, your employees, why we have this agreement. Uh, the definitions, what are the terms? You need to define focus acts. You need to define delinquent act. You need to define whatever the case may be, graduated system, whatever terms that you are using later in there, you need to define it. And the terms of agreement themselves, that's the meat of it. How are you going to operationalize this? Your focus acts, your alternatives, what does it look like? What does the graduated process look like? Okay. And then quality control is very important. Who and how is going to be implementing and providing oversight? For example, here in Clayton County, really quick, my intake, the agreement is, is that when a school resource officer sends a complaint from the school, they will look at it and determine whether or not it meets the school uh, agreement or if there's any special exception. If not, they will return it with a memo, explain the reason why, work it out, and have that conversation and make a final decision, okay? Um, so that's what we've worked on. And then the, there, to help everyone, I've broken it down for you for each component, okay, each section, what are the goals and conditions? You will ask yourself this. These are the things that need to go in that section. So I've broken it down for you in that way. And by the way, we do have many sample agreements that have been signed across the country that I can get to you. Okay? And finally, I'm going to leave you with this, and I can't really go through, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory, is that you want to the stakeholders group, this is something you can modify, whatever you want to do with it, but these are your action steps. It says who's responsible. It could be more than one person. What's the deadline? It helps to guide you, uh, your stakeholder group, your focus acts, identifying the responses, your graduated responses, uh, coming up with your quality control measures, uh, then the interagency agreement itself, when you're going to sign the MOU. One thing I haven't talked about is bridging. I want to say this. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some kids that are not going to respond to your traditional alternatives. And it's likely because they're chronically disruptive for clinical reasons. Please don't give up on them. In Clayton County in 2010, we created the Clayton County System of Care. And the school system refers to chronically disruptive kids to the system of care who are assessed to identify the underlying causes of their chronic disruptive behavior. And they are matched with clinical or other types of programs to assist them and get into the family where the schools cannot do that. So I just need to, I need to bring that up. And then collective impact is that system of care. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. Some folks have identified an existing 501c3. Some have created a 501c3. Um, you know, it could be in a public agency, but you need to have some type of agency that is, is assessing these chronically disruptive kids and getting resources, broken resources for them, because the schools cannot do it. You cannot put it on the back of the schools, okay? Um, so I think I've gotten through that, Teresa, and we're at the top of the hour. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for um, engaging and participating on this webinar. Thank you so much, Judge Teske, um, for your insight and your knowledge. Um, and, and, and really helping people move this work forward. I want to uh, let everyone know that the NCJ of CJ is available for um, ad you know, additional training and technical assistance. Please contact Ello or myself um, with any additional follow-up questions. And um, I think at this time, if um, people have additional questions, we can kind of open it up. So Ello, um, has pointed us to the feature here of raising your hand if you have a question and we will unmute you. Um, while people are kind of figuring that out, I do have some questions that I'll ask right now. Um, this is from Gabriella, a fantastic question. How does this process align fit into case 
where the school has an MOU with law enforcement on the role of an SRO. All right, say the last part again, I, I lost you. How does this process align or fit into a case where a school has an MOU with law enforcement on the role of an SRO? Where they have an MOU, the school has an MOU with law enforcement on I the think, role. I think, the, I think really the question is, is there exist an existing MOU? If there's an existing MOU, um, you know, how, how can you incorporate some of the roles and responsibilities of an SRO into that? Yes. Okay. So we have engaged jurisdictions that, you know, when we come in, they say, well, we already have this MOU. Um, the, the problem that we have found, and we've had this conversation with them, is that, okay, um, you know, your, the MOU, though, does not, is, does not um, describe with specificity, okay, um, you know, how SROs and educators should be handling matters on campus. I mean, most of the MOUs I've seen have been couched in general terms, okay, um, whereas the MOU that we're talking about here is it actually says, you know, these focus acts are not going to, presumptively are not going to be referred to the juvenile court. You are not, your first thought isn't going to be, I'm going to arrest the kid and send the kid to juvenile court. Most MOUs, okay, uh, you know, that are entered into, and, and they're entered into because the school system is contracting an outside agency, your local police department, to bring officers in. So the biggest bulk of your MOU happens to be how much they're getting paid, how many officers there are, uh, but does not get really into the specifics of the role. I mean, like I said, they're couched in generality. But what we want to do is take the existing MOU. And some folks have scrapped the MOU and started all over, or they, but most take the existing MOU and they amend it. Why? Because the bulk of that MOU is talking about the, con the actual contracting of the police that involves the cost and things, of the number of officers, things like that that are, that are necessary, okay? So rather than, you know, undoing that, scrapping that, you amend the agreement to provide more specificity. So you would take all, you would take that, that school justice decision tree, okay, and the terms of that part and the questions that I ask that engages you and, and then develop that. You would develop your focus acts, your alternatives, a graduated response grid, for example, is what we have in ours. We have a graduated response grid. And then you would develop a separate instrument, but you would title it amended, okay, MOU. All right, that's all you would do. And at the end of that, you would say that this MOU hereby incorporates any and all, um, you know, language of the MOU dated such and such a date and is, you know, enforceable. Okay. Um, Judge, we don't have anyone raising their, ha their hands, but there's still a lot of people that are still on the call. So I have a lot of questions that I didn't get through on the chat box. So, okay. um, and I just want to, don't be scared, everyone, raise your hand. And, um, you know, this is your opportunity to connect. So please, please do. But um, until that time, we'll just get through the questions. But this is That's for me, Robert. Robert. Teresa, if you don't mind, um, I did put in the chat box how you can interact. Um, if you look at the above, there's a hand raise option. I'm, I don't know if folks can see this, but there's a hand raise option. If you click on that, I'm able to unmute folks for you to talk with Judge Tusky and Teresa if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Carl raised his hand. So um, you know what, I'm going to ask this one question and then we'll um, get to Carl's question. So, because I think this is a really good question. Um, it was posed by Robert and he said, even with a focus app, do these models lead to any disparate treatment? How does this safeguard against gender and or racial disparity in implementation? I think that's a fantastic question. Yeah, it, it is. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be what I call operator error, okay? Um, and keep in mind that um, that disagreement alone, all right, uh, 
has reduced our racial disparity, okay, uh, by as much as 80 percent, okay, um, and and so we we know we know that just simply having the conversation about just not arresting kids, okay, uh, is going to uh, have some impact, okay, on reducing racial disparity, all right? So that part we know, all right? Um, it's really about the quality control measure, and that's why we put it in, that you have to have language in there where there is somebody or some group that, first of all, you have to collect the data. So it's something I didn't get into, but when you look at the quality control, notice there's a place you've got to collect the data. You need to collect it based on race and gender, okay? You need to match that to the total population of, of kids of color and, and their gender, okay? And, and ask the question, what is the disparity, okay? And then you have to have your benchmark, okay, uh, you know, the year before you, you implemented this. Um, and then you have to develop a, this quality control that is looking at this data, um, and, and this is going to create the transparency, but there has to be a question asked as part of quality control, what, if any, Uh, based on race and that at that point when you see there's still disparity then you have to go back and ask yourself where is it happening and how is it happening for example you may need to break it down by school to school okay is is this one school that's operating under the same MOU have a greater uh, disparate treatment of kids of color than the school over here. Hmm, okay. Well, so what's going on in terms of the handling of those cases over there, all right? So that part of it can be time consuming, but it's extremely important because, because you have to guard, no matter, no matter what instrument you have, that gets you on this pathway to reduce racial and ethnic disparity. You have to include in the agreement some type of mechanism that collects the data and asks the question about racial, ethnic, and gender disparity and forces you to look at it and go back and tweak the agreement. Or it may not be the agreement. It may likely be operator error that requires more training because you've identified that one school has higher uh, disparate treatment than another, and it comes down to the personalities in that school. All right, let's go ahead and unmute Carl, and um, we'll have him ask the question to judge. Go ahead, Carl. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, pretty general in this regard. Um, would Judge uh, Teske have any idea or suggestion about how often um, MOU should be reviewed, evaluated, and updated. Uh, we have one here that's been in place since 2009. And quite frankly, I think it's outdated. And I was just curious to know whether the judge uh, have some thoughts on that in Wonderful. terms of reviewing yeah. those every three, four, five years or something of that nature. Well, Carl, I yes, I do, Carl. Carl, you can hear me still? Are yes, you on I the can. Line? Okay. Yes. So, yeah, so... So we're, we're actually live and interactive. Um, yes, I do. And I, what we recommend is that they be reviewed every year over the summer break. Okay? Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, every year over the summer break. Because if we go back to the last question that was asked about, uh, you know, racial uh, and ethnic and gender uh, disparities, okay, I, be, I believe that that issue, that question that was asked, and I appreciate the question, is, 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 is paramount and is one of the primary reasons for why we need this MOU, okay? Um, and because it's so important, 
Um, we have to we have to look at it regularly, okay? Um, and here's another reason why, Carl. The thing about that's unique about school systems, and it's going to depend upon the superintendent. But you know, I have found most school systems, uh, despite um, you know the, the the intention of the superintendent and how hard the superintendent works, principals tend to run their schools the way they like to run them, and that can cause disparate treatment in many ways from mm -hmm. school to school, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, and sometimes, you know, you have this attrition factor where principles change and you have a new principal. And that, that itself begs that we need to be looking this on, at a yearly, on a yearly basis. And the reason I say during the summer is because those kids are out you have more time, you're not having, the principals aren't having to look at, you know, aren't having to pay, you know, keep their schools safe and make sure the kids are doing this and doing that and the teachers are being taken care of and all that stuff. And so now, uh, you know, during the summer, we have found it's the best time that we get together um, and, and, you know, we, we, you know we, we set it down for like half a day. We may end up needing to come back or we do it electronically, but we are able to get most of it done. You know, in a morning session, we bring breakfast, uh, the data is produced, my IT person uh, brings the data um, broken down and, you know, like I said, number of school offenses, what do the school offenses look like, um, what do the alternatives look like, how many kids were sent to these alternative programs, what's the race, what's the gender, um, you know, we look at all that stuff, okay, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, so I, I would recommend on a yearly basis. I appreciate that. Uh, it's yes. kind of surprising, but I can certainly understand, as you said, based on that earlier question that was asked about the disparities between uh, different groups of people uh, and, and, and in, in concert with new principals coming in. Absolutely. But I thank you for that, Judge. Real welcome, Carl. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, so we have time for a couple, maybe one more question, and I'm going to answer a few things um, just really quickly. Um, some, a lot of people have kind of been asking, how do you kind of start this? And I, I want to maybe say that if you're really just at the beginning of building a school justice uh, partnership or collaborative, an MOU might not be the first step. Um, it, it may really depend on building some consensus, and then you get to an MOU. Um, so we have, I put up a link to our practice guide, and that really kind of gives you some steps uh, of how to kind of start the work, and um, Judge Tusky was obviously very instrumental in developing that practice guide. Um, so I want to get to this question from Joe, and he says, how are you defining focus acts? Okay, so I am defining focus acts as any um, in, in, in our in our definition section, we just simplify. It's just we it, it is a delinquent act that is identified as an act that shall uh, that is no. Actually, we now to the juvenile court. Okay. I just now, that. Can you repeat you, the last um, thing that you just said? Yes, it is. It, Focus Act is defined as a delinquent act that is presumptively not referred to the juvenile court. Now, when I say presumptively, um, and and not and, and forgive me, I'm just I'm. Uh, there may be lawyers out there or those who are familiar with you know certain legal standards uh, and, and that. So forgive me, but just and for those who don't. So in the law we have this concept called rebuttable presumption. And when you have re a, a rebuttable presumption, that means you will act a certain way. It is presumed you will act a certain way unless it can be rebutted. What happened for us is that in, the, in our first generation of the MOU, because they were just real four simple misdemeanors, we didn't have to worry about the word presumption, okay? they shouldn't have been referred at all, period, the end, okay? 
But because we have now embraced all misdemeanors, right, we have to be very careful not to invade too much the law enforcement discretionary uh, domain. And what I mean by that is that we want to be careful that we just don't assume that because it's a misdemeanor, there's not something that is underneath that that is really problematic and may, may require some type of intervention beyond these responses, okay? Like, for example, the possession of drugs, okay, I think is a, an easy example. Um, you know, but so we, we now use the word uh, pre presumption uh, or presumptive, okay? So it's a very simple definition. Um, I, I will, let me add on, I meant, I referenced earlier that even though, so, so what happens is that we define focus act that way, but then when we get to the terms in the term section, then we write out what the focus acts are. So the focus, so focus acts, you know, uh, shall uh, include the following. Now we don't have to say or presumptively this because we've already defined focus act with the word presumptive. We just, in the terms, we just simply say, let's say paragraph one, focus act shall include, you know, now for ours is very simple, all misdemeanors, okay? But you know, if you're starting off a, a new uh, MOU, you don't really have all the resources to, you know, to really respond to all of these. Uh, you may be like Clayton County in the beginning, we took our baby step and there was this four. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, just to get an MOU done that identifies is a start, is a great start. Because let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, within six months, court, we reduce school referrals by 54% within six months, just with those four acts alone, okay? So um, I hope I, I answered that question uh, to, to, to your satisfaction. I think that it might be helpful if you can get your hands on our agreement. I think that Teresa or Ello may have posted uh, a, the Clayton County sample, um, the Clayton County agreement, and you can look at that. Yeah, and we did, and um, some people were willing to share their own MOUs, and we just oh, want to wonderful. say thank, thank you for that. Um, we can only share MOUs in jurisdictions that have given us that permission, um, unless it's public domain, we cannot do that, but um, Clayton County can be found on ours. Um, so I don't know, Judge, do you have time for one more question? We are at, at 20 minutes, but um, if you have time uh, for I'm okay. Okay. I, 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 cleared, I cleared my court docket, so I'm, I'm oh. fine. Okay, Stan raised his hand. Stan, do you want to ask your question? Okay, let's unmute Stan, and he can ask it. And then I'll just ask um, Judge that you, after you answer it, kind of um, close us out. And um, again, I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated. This has been a fantastic webinar. Um, let's see. Ella, can you unmute Stan? Oh, I think. I'm sorry, Stan. I am looking at. Uh, I, I I noticed that you're not on a telephone line, so unfortunately, I'm not able to connect you with Judge Teske. But if you'd like to ask your question in the chat box. And he did, Ello. So Stan said, I have observed a reluctance of publicly staffed and funded schools on reservations to respond to tribal input, and what you describe sounds like graduated sanctions and restorative justice familiar to tribes. The question is, is there any federal statutes that require public schools to collaborate or coordinate with tribes? Sorry, Sam, we couldn't get you to out, um, on the line, but there's a question. So go ahead, Judge. Well, that's a good question. And first of all, I, I want to acknowledge the first part of the question, which is quite informative, and that is uh, your um, reference to uh, graduated sanctions and restorative justice familiar to tribes. In fact, I. I, I want to make it very clear to those who are still online here that it's really, um, you know, it's 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 really uh, the the tribal uh, culture that has schooled us. Okay, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about uh, the rest of us, whether you're um, 
Anglo or a uh, American of uh, of color, um, you know, other than a Native uh, uh, Indian. Um, you know, the the fact of the matter is, we really have drawn this from them, okay. And uh, so I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I just want to get that and make that very clear that we owe a lot, uh, you know, to uh, to our native, uh, you know, Indians uh, in their contribution to juvenile justice. And it's only us beginning to figure it out when they've been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, but to now to get to your question. Is there any federal statutes that require public schools to collaborate or coordinate with tribes? That's a good question, Stan. What I want you to do um, is if somehow, if Stan, if you can right now give me your email, if you could type it in, and I'm looking at the, the chat line here, okay, and I am going to call the Department of Justice. I I do and well I have provided um, uh, litigative uh, expertise to the Department of Justice on this matter of um, of zero tolerance and racial discrimination, and I am going to call my contacts there at the uh, litigation division, the civil rights division, and get them to fast track this and 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 help me. Um, uh, and, and, and get an answer, and I'm going to send it straight to you. And let's see here. Oh, here we go. You also have Patrice Payne from the American Bar Association, and if you could get her email, and she may have an answer for you as well. But anyway, so Nick's SR, gotcha. I'm at DSHS, so you're in Washington. Wonderful. I'm going to get right on this, Stan, and I'll get you – the answer to this. I hope that there is something. That would be wonderful. Something I could put in my toolbox as well. Thank you, Judge. Um, we appreciate your advocacy, um, you know, for Stan and, and for all of this work. Um, if you want to give us some closing remarks, um, I think that that would be fantastic. And again, thank you, everyone. And um, please visit our website. Feel free to email me. Um, or Ello, and um, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can offline. So, Judge, if you want to close us out, that would be great. Yeah, let me let me just quickly say, um, I, you know, something I didn't reference, and and um, you know, this was inspired through my work under the Annie E. Casey JDA model, the eight core strategies for which, you know, there's been a, a very wonderful relationship between the National Council and, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation, as well as all of them with OJJDP. Um, if you look at the eight core strategies from collaboration, identifying leadership, and so forth, and so on, you'll you know you'll understand why. But most important of all, to reduce to reduce racial and ethnic disparity, which is one of the core strategies. Collecting data, I think everything we've talked about hits on all of the eight core strategies of the JDI model. But I also want to say this: I owe such a great gratitude to the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges for my fellow judges, uh, the board of directors who voted on a resolution against zero, uh, uh, zero tolerance policies. Uh, when it comes to judicial leadership, we have, we have some of the greatest judges who are working with the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges, and I'm so proud of them. I'm proud, proud to be a member of the National Council of Juvenile Court Family Judges, and you don't have to be a judge to be a member, by the way. You don't have to be a judge to be on the board of directors anymore. And so we are a very diverse group. But the folks at the National Council are, I mean, they have such a great amount of expertise, and I rely so much on them, and they have helped me so much in furthering this. In fact, Teresa mentioned a moment ago about the practice guide, and I had a recent conversation, and we're hoping to redo, that, redo the practice guide in such a way to include these these tools, um, and I would like for the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges, and I've reached out to OJJDP um, and, and, and their help in this regard so that we could get a practice guide out that has these tools and breaks them down so we don't have to depend only on webinars, 
but we can do webinars maybe and also send out this practice guide and make that available as well so everything is all in hand for each jurisdiction. Do not be afraid to reach out to me. Um, you could do it through the National Council. Uh, I'm even, if you want to take this on your own, um, and you're, if you let me know in advance when you're doing a stakeholders group meeting and you would like for me to be phoned in, uh, I would, I, and then when you're working on a Focus Act decision tree or any of these decision trees and you let me know when you're doing it, then I'll make myself available. If anyone has questions, you need some assistance in working through it, I will make myself available. I'm glad to do it. And I am so happy to see so many people in, who got on this and are involved in it, and this is a sign of the times that it's time to change the way we do business when it comes to school discipline. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for your questions. Thank you, everyone.